probably start then a few more people. Before I start one announcement, the desktop search talk will be after this talk in the KD and Gnome room. It's been moved from the 11 o'clock slot to after this talk, KD and Gnome room. If you're interested in desktop search and this sort of stuff. Okay? So, so, uh, it'd be interesting to talk about how we, we get a stable kernel, or how I try and get a stable kernel from the things Lennox put out. One of the things that happened with the 2.6 kernel is that Lennox decided instead of having a, a stable kernel release with small changes, he was going to keep doing larger numbers of changes in each release. And in Andrew Morton would maintain a, a separate kernel tree where new ideas are tested. So things go into Andrew Morton's MM kernel tree. They might work. They might get fixed. That some things will go in, some things they go back out again because they don't work. Other things get improved, go through to the standard kernel. So each 2.6 kernel, unlike 2.4, is merging something like 10 megabytes of code and release. Now, anyone here who's ever written 10 megabytes of code will notice that 10 megabytes of code always has bugs in it. <laughs> 10 lines of code usually has bugs in it. Um, so, when, 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 with Linus's uh, process, he starts off by merging the big changes, often from Andrew Moore, Kernel tree. Then, in order to trick more people into testing it, he calls it a release candidate. And this gets smaller changes added, or things which you don't want to have to change but are necessary to make fixes. And after four or five release candidates, Linus releases 268, 269, 2610, whatever. This is where the problem starts. Because then it then goes off to work on the next one. And so we were seeing a situation where lots of people download the new 2.6 new two kernel. And okay, we know what's going to happen. Large, a lot of changes. Most people don't test the release candidate or development code. That's what other people are for. Right? You test your files some of other people's data. <coughs> Uh, 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 that's how it works. So the release candidates will pick out a lot of the really stupid bugs or things with just plain bad ideas. And Linus is very good at figuring out, oh, we, we should go in this direction. This is the right long-term solution to a problem. He's a terrible engineer. And I'm sure you would agree with that statement. All the little fiddly detail that makes the difference between creating a piece of really, really great software and making a piece of really reliable software. All the tedious cross-checking, finding out which little details have been missed, beta testing, are not his particular hobby. So, as soon as the release comes out, within two or three days, the mailing list will have large numbers of emails most of which are about the same small number of bugs. So a release will go out, and two or three days after that, there will be 150 emails saying, I have got a VIA such and such chip set, and my computer no longer works. Or I have a, an iPod mini, and every time I plug it into my machine, my iPod mini crashes. So, oh well. <laughs> that one wasn't our fault, that was Apple's fault. But, so these things pop up. Not all of them pop up because of bugs. Some of them pop up, as in the iPod example, because a new piece of hardware comes on the market, and we do something which triggers a bug in that hardware. The second thing that happens is these people keep finding security holes. The good thing about most of the security holes nowadays are found by verification tools. They're not found because somebody has rooted, rooted a machine. But as soon as a security hole is found, and it's particularly if it becomes public, you need to fix it. So we need something between the releases, something to actually take up these critical fixes, and to pick up 
the security stuff. So that if you're trying to actually run a Linux TTX kernel, you can actually get work done and know what you should be running. So the vendors do this. We do this for Fedora. And a lot of the AC kernel work really overlaps what we do for Fedora for the users of Fedora. And Susan do this for their customers and Debian are doing it. Everybody is doing the same work. Except Linux. It, it also turns out that the early problems you get, the ones you see particularly off mailing lists, are normally very easy to fix. Because as soon as the release comes out, all of these bug reports start appearing saying you've broken this. At which point the author of the relevant change almost immediately, and almost every time he looks at it and goes, whoops, that would be my mistake. And they'll post a fix. And ten minutes later the fix is in the, the development tree, but it's only in the development tree. So the, the, these early things are run immediately because you take you take the base tree, you take 2.6.10, you look at 2.6.11, first development release, and you say, well, well, apply that patch, apply that patch. You pull a small number of changes, a very small number of changes out of the standard kernel, and all of a sudden you have something that's a lot more stable, a lot more reliable. Because the bugs everybody hits almost always get found very early. So those are relatively easy to deal with. There, there are some little problems. Um, sometimes you see a fix. And you think, ah, oh, this is perfect. Move this fix into my stable kernel tree. And it's followed four hours later by a, I must have been drunk, don't apply that patch. <laughs> Or it turns into a week-long discussion about the correct way to fix the problem. And some problems are genuinely hard to fix. So during the 2.6.10 release, somebody noticed that certain file systems do strange things on 64-bit machines. When you do read or write system calls, and the length is longer than 2 gigabytes. Yes, people occasionally did this. And one or two file systems had used int where they meant long. It never mattered on a 32-bit machine. And fixing that isn't the case of applying a small patch. There's significant work in the kernel to do the job properly. And for some of those, you have to cheat. And you, you apply very, very ugly fixes to a stable tree, in the happy knowledge that someone will fix it properly before the next release. Security errors come from all sorts of places. Um, vendors get messages in their Mozilla along the lines of, I've just found this huge great security error. So I thought the public bug reporting system was clearly the right place to put it. <laughs> um, several Mozilla's now, when you mark a bug as security, also mark it as private automatically. So you get security, that comes from people just reading code. A lot of things in Bugzilla actually come from students. Because they get set an undergraduate or uh, a master's question, like, read the following part of the Linux kernel and explain how it works. And they read it and they decide it doesn't. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, presumably, the other 20 or 25 people in the class all thought it did. And some of them goes, well, it does this, it does that, and, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> some of it comes from people who are just looking for security errors. So there are people who are very interested in security, and they, they may see a security report for one operating system or a particular program. So we had some in the kernel which were found because somebody was looking at doing graphics programs, and he noticed there were a lot of graphics programs which took a, a user input value multiplied it by a constant, and then did a memory allocation and then copied data into it. And some of them finally realized, well, if my image is just under two gigabytes long, and you multiply that by two, well, it comes out to about 40. And then I'm going to copy four gigabytes of data into it. I see an opportunity here. And someone saw that, that's interesting. I wonder if the kernel does that. And so we then start to get a pile of reports from someone saying, 
I've been looking through the kernel for bugs similar to this, I found this. This long list of things starts to appear. Because certain bugs, security bugs, everybody makes the same mistake. And it's only when somebody first really thinks about it that you see the problem is in every single piece of code. They come from a thing called vendor sec, which is the multi-vendor security list. It's, it's a way of privately discussing security holes between vendors so that we can do things like coordinate releases so that everybody has an up-to-date kernel before we tell the rest of the world here's an interesting way of completely breaking it. It can matter because if you, it's not a problem as much with minor security holes or local security holes. But if, for example, you've got a remote way of crashing machines, you really want to fix that before you tell the bad guys about it. Because the chances are they won't find out if you do it properly. The kernel mailing list is also a source of security fixes. Sometimes people say, I found a security hole. Sometimes you get emails that says, I've been looking at this code and I'm trying to understand why it doesn't check that. And mailers of that sort of are frequently worth looking at. And you get private emails from people. There is another actual security one we're starting to see now. There are one or two people starting up companies specializing in verification tools. Uh, people like Coverity. And they have been doing a lot of testing on Linux because the source code's out there. And so we get reports from people like that saying, our, our verification tool says this is wrong. And a tool called Sparse, which is something Linux and others have been working on. Um, security errors mostly are easy to fix. Most of the security errors which turn up are there on the form, you don't check that something. Or often they're error cases. If the following error occurs, you run all this code which no one has ever tested. And because no one has ever tested it, it's wrong. So we find code which is along the lines of take a lock, allocate some memory. If you didn't get the memory, return. Don't bother giving the lock back or all the other things you should have done. And people don't notice that they never, these cases rarely happen in, the real, in real life. And then somebody says, well, I can force this to happen deliberately, and it's all of a sudden it's a security issue. It's good that most of these are easy to fix because obviously security things are things that you want to get into a stable kernel very fast. So when I'm doing AC kernels, I try and make sure there is a new AC kernel as soon as we're sure about the fix the security model. So that it's out there for people who want to run it. The hard ones. Design errors. These, these get to be a real pain. Um, because the fix, the, the little sort of old approach to a design error is to fix it. If you're working on a development kernel and some, some piece of code is fundamentally wrong, you throw it away, you write a replacement. The replacement is very likely to have errors in it. So it's not something you want to merge if you're trying to create a stable kernel. But at the same time, you have to fix these things. So, you, you sort of think, you, do you look for the, to the future? Um, do you do small fix? But what tend, I've tended to do to try and keep a stable kernel is put small, sometimes really, really horrible fixes into the AC kernel. And I can do that because I know that the next release, I won't need them. Whereas if you're trying to do the development, the real development of the kernel, let us all the time having to say, if I put this horrible fix in, I will have to look after it for two years or three years, or until someone is stupid enough to have to rewrite it. Um, so he's very keen to have maintainable code, whereas what I need for the stable AC tree is to have code that works. Other problems show up things like changes the multi user space behavior. Because you don't want to fix a bug to find that you've broken half a dozen user applications. Um, we've had one of those recently, in 2011 release camp that breaks a couple of applications. 
Um, so that's a change of number. In fact, I've now gone back to Leonard and said, um, why is this patch in the kernel that breaks stuff? Other times we have to break applications for security reasons. Um, so a lot of people got upset about CD burning in 268 and 269 because we, we changed the way certain things work when the CD burning application didn't work properly for a while. On the other hand, the bug we fixed was one where anybody who could burn a CD was also allowed to do things like flash the firmware of their drive. And it, very people thought that while undergraduate students should be allowed to write CDs, undergraduate students should not be allowed to turn the CD ROM drive into, into junk. So the next question you always have to ask is, does the error actually matter? So a lot of, a lot of the error reports and things that get fixed in the kernel are things like standards compliance. So someone will fix a problem that the kernel returns the wrong error code if you are exactly at the end of the file and you write two gigabytes of data to the file and the disk is full. And then they will proceed to quote a line and paragraph from POSIX standard. So all of those kind of things I don't put into the stable code. Because if it's been like that for 10 years and no one has noticed, it's not a problem. We get lots of errors which are root only. So a lot of the bugs are in less used code, they're in system configuration code. And so you can discover that if you're a super, super user, you can crash your machine because of this bug. If I'm a super user, I can type power off and the same thing happens. So I, it's, it's another kind of bug, another, another thing you can avoid putting into a stable tree. You get harmless or near harmless errors. So some of the 2.6 kernels sometimes reported wrong values for the amount of free space on NFS partitions. And I didn't put that change into the AC stable kernel because the change had only been tested with other NFS changes. And it didn't really matter that occasionally you've got a wrong number from DF. It's a bug, but it's not, not serious. And that can be Every time you make a change, every little thing you fix, all of those changes can have surprising effects somewhere else. Certain parts of the kernel are really bad for that. Um, particularly in 2.4, there was a problem that every time you fixed the virtual memory code to solve one problem, you broke something else. So you fixed the virtual memory code so that Oracle worked properly, and then Quake didn't work, or this kind of thing or your desktop was incredibly slow. Over the longer term, it gets harder. So as Linux keeps adding changes, you start to get to the point where you have sort of seven megabytes of difference between the, the, the Linux kernel you're applying fixes to and the Linux kernel everybody else is working on. And if you've got the, sort of the thing about magnitude, you're talking about a difference between the two kernels, which is probably the size of DOS. So we do a reasonable amount of development. And you're looking at a change, and the change depends on and has been tested against a vast number of other changes in the kernel. In fact, sometimes you even have to rewrite the change. The good thing about it is obviously as time goes on, all the most common bugs should have been hit. Um, it doesn't work with security, because security bugs just turn up when they feel like it. But you can often avoid applying changes later on because it's a bug, very few people hit it, or it's an obscure piece of hardware. And it, become, it can become more risky to fix the bug than to leave it as it is. Because you, you know what the bug is, it's, it's not too serious, but, but you don't know what the fix will do. You know what the fix is supposed to do, and you can test that it does what it's supposed to do. But you have no idea what the side effects may be. And those can be very, very surprising. If you keep going on trying to backport stuff for a very long time, like more than one release, it gets really, really hard. And you start to need teams of engineers, big test environments, um, simulation setups, and all sorts of fancy stuff. So for the AC kernel, as soon as Linux produces a new kernel, I start working on that and drop support for the old one. 
it's just too hard to, to sort of keep 269 going for three or four kernel releases. Um, the people who do that are the people doing the, the enterprise Linux kernels, as SUSE and Red Enterprise kernels, and it takes them teams of engineers to do this work. There's only one of me, and my main test suite is BZ flag, so it's a little less thorough than some people's. It's, it's a very good test suite. It tests the graphics are working, the 3D is working, the networking is working, the file system is working, and programs can be run. It's a very complete test suite. It's a lot more fun than some of the others. <laughs> and so, look, so the thing I'm trying to do as well though, is to remove chain. In other words, as soon as a bug is really fixed, make sure that it's tagged, this bug is really fixed. So the next Linux release, it's another patch you can get rid of. And where there are changes that Linux does not have, to try and force feed them to him as, as hard as necessary. Because in the ideal world, which we're slightly far from at the moment, every single AC release, when you went to a new kernel, would start from blank, because everything would have been fixed in the previous kernel. Various things are taking too long to fix, so there are hack fixes that have carried on for a while. But that's where we should be. Where it's kind of, oh, yeah, they're all fixed, no problem. So, this is how I, this is how I currently work. Um, there is a mailing list that only a few people seem to be subscribed to, which, which is a mailing list of every single change set Linus applies to the kernel. It's thrilling reading. It is <laughs> it's the most, possibly the least exciting mailing list I am on. But it's very useful because you then take each chain set and classify them. So I, I dump every chain set into evolution because it receives email and it's got a search function that works. And as I, as I go through them, I try to tag them. So you look for changes which are just cleanups. So a lot of, a lot of kernel patches are just people tidying up code, fixing spellings, making it more maintainable. Things don't matter for stability. Then to try and filter out things like driver updates, which are not, not fixes, where someone has said, it's now faster, it now supports more hardware. These are things which are not bug fixes, so you, you can drop them out. And also to look for security fixes. Because Linus has this bad habit of fixing security holes quietly. And he's still under the mistaken assumption this is a good idea. Unfortunately, there are quite a few people who read all the kernel patches, and several of them read all the kernel patches to look for security holes. Um, there's a thing going on there as a proposal to have, actually have a, a proper Linux security list, so that when Linux fixes a security hole, he can actually tell the rest of us. Or at least the people he thinks should know, and then in the short term, everybody else. Um, from this, you, you end up with a collection of patches that look interesting. And you then try and find an excuse not to apply them. To get the number down as low as you possibly can. The other tool I have is a program to look at which sequence of patches have been put. So I can look at a patch and say, that fix looks like it, it's an important bug fix. But also ask the question, what other change sets were applied before this in Linux tree? Others what other, what other changes has it been tested with or might it rely upon? And sometimes you get these long series of changes you have to go back, work through them, try and understand, <coughs> do any of the other changes matter, how they connect. For identifying actual problem reports, it's relatively easy. There are enough users of the base 2.6 kernels that you can literally just count the number of emails complaining about each bug to determine which are the really important ones. In the day after a release, you just have to look at the subject lines on the, on the mailing list to see where the main problems actually are. The second thing to try and identify for fixes are problems that are perhaps only a few people were reporting, but whose effects are bad. And there are really two kinds of problems like that. There's one which cause silent failure. So in other words, it doesn't work, but you don't notice. Those can be particularly bad. 
It looks like everything looks like it's working, but it's not. And the other ones are because things that corrupt data. Because you don't want to find that the thesis on your disk actually consists mostly of random numbers. Or that your database has interesting random things in it. It really, really does upset people. So, so those kind of corruption bugs we try, I try and fix as fast as possible. Because those are both, although they're not things where everyone is jumping up there saying machine crash, they're really, really important things. And they may be affecting a lot of people who haven't noticed. And also try and identify easy fixes. Um, but sometimes you'll see changes where you take an existing drive and you add new PCI identifiers. So, in other words, a new piece of hardware has come out which works precisely the same way as the old hardware. Those kind of fixes do get applied because one of the great things about a change like that is you know it can't work well, out. You think you know it can't break anybody else's system because you're only adding support for a new piece of hardware. And for building patches, start with the most critical bug fixes. So if you look at the first AC release, the goal is to fix the critical things. Any security thing that should come up immediately, which is unusual. And to try and avoid anything where you get sets of changes which interact. Because you always want to release which is debuggable. So for a two complex set of changes, for example, to the NFS code, you want to do the first most critical one in the first release, and the second one in the second release. That way, if one of them causes a problem, you will know where it breaks. When, which of the two patches have the problem in it. Another thing to try and do is to spread fixes out. Again, for debugging. So if you've got lots of fixes which aren't urgent, you can just slip them in with individual patches rather than taking all of the non urgent ones and producing this gigantic patch file you then can't debug. Things that go with it. Uh, if there's a security fix, it's a bad idea to mix security fixes with other fixes you're perhaps less sure about. Because you never want to have users in a situation where they've got to choose between a kernel with a security hole and a kernel that doesn't work. You always want a kernel without a security hole that works. It's really, really important that that one exists at all times. So when you fix a security hole, sometimes I actually I'll have a patch half prepared you have to throw away all of the changes so far. Just put the security fix in and release that, and then go back to what you were working on. Tools that into evolution simply because the search function works. I've not even done a detailed analysis of the tools, if, patch, usual things. Um, I don't use BigKeeper for licensing reasons. I don't use various tools like Quilt, which I probably should use, because I'm just not <laughs> I've just not had time to play with them and love it. Okay, Harold. So, in, in terms of goals, this is sort of where we're trying to go. Fix, fix the, the, the bugs that the users hit. The, the immediate, Linus, why did you release those? That, that just yet now kind of bugs. The ones which have the, the relevant developer hiding under the table thinking, no, why me? And to defer high risk fixes. So, when you see straight away after the release there's a minor problem, it's possibly not that the minor problem needs fixing immediately. The minor problem might be, might be one which is complicated. And then, over time, what you normally find is there's an initial rush of, of fixes as people say, oh, it doesn't work on this hardware. You've broken this part of the SCSI layer. If I have an IDE error, or something horrible now happens. All those things. And then as this quietens down, and you get just the, the less serious, the less common bugs, you can then start to test things at the higher risk fixes. Put out, I put out sometimes put out AC patches and say, you know, this is a test AC patch. If you, unless you've got the following problem, you probably don't need to try it. And enough people will test it just to be reasonably confident it's okay. And they said, you know, don't mix security bugs and risky fixes. That really, really upsets people. And try to make sure that users all, there's, always, there's always an answer to what stable kernel should I be running. So you have to definitively say, I, I, need, I, need, I, need, I need the right kernel, what is it? The longer term thing is track all these fixes, persuade Linus to fix the bugs, 
And one, also, once the AC stuff is basically stable, try not to release any more, because the more sets of changes you do over time, the harder it gets to be sure that those changes are correct and well tested, and the less people benefit. It, it's sort of tricky because the majority of the users will, will say, oh, it's, it's working for me now, it's great. But if, if you are the one person who continuously hits the bug, then obviously you're unhappy to be told, well, we don't think it's in everyone else's interest that we solve your problem. Because the great thing about open source is that it's, you can reply to emails like that saying, I'm not going to fix this, but here is, what's, here is probably the correct patch. Just apply it to your kernel, then everybody else doesn't have to take the risk. We get obscure architecture bugs. Um, in the interest of sanity, I don't apply fixes for mainframes, the IA64 platform, and the Spark to my tree. Because I figure that both the Spark users, the IA64 and the IA64 user, are probably capable of maintaining their own kernel. And all the mainframe people you talk to won't run anything that IBM hasn't personally, hasn't personally signed off in writing. Um, there are actually now a few mainframe Slackware people, which is interesting. And there was somebody trying to build a mainframe Gen 2 at one point. I just have to imagine building, because it's not a very fast build machine. It's not to build the open office on an S390, it's not nice. Um, but it's, they're, such, they're such small communities that they're <coughs> trying to deal with fixes for them which overlap common code. Again, it was not really interesting for the majority of the users. We also have one or two areas which come in the fix one bug, break something else category. Um, the virtual memory is the most notorious of this. Every time you fix a case where the virtual memory system misbehaves for somebody, you will break somebody else's code. Um, it's getting better, but it's a long and slow process. And it, um, sta stable fixing kernels are not the place to play this game. Essentially, the virtual memory subsystem is a chaotic system, which means that any small change you make will have random, bizarre, and unpredictable results <laughs> that you cannot model or analyze. And so you know, people will tell you effects uh, to the virtual memory. The virtual memory system has been wrongly accounting this for nine months. It's an obvious and clear fix. The problem is, the rest of the virtual memory system has been tuned to the fact that this number is wrong. Somewhere else, again, someone said, it seems to work best if you multiply this by about two and a half. Right? <laughs> and then there's a reason it works best if you multiply it by two and a half, because it's counting wrong in the first place. But to understand all those dependencies, it's really, really difficult. So the virtual memory is one area I really, really try not to touch. There are other areas in high risk areas, um, things like disk device drivers. So I try very, very hard when I'm doing patches not to do changes to low level disk code. So if you change things like the, the tuning algorithm for an IDE drive, you don't want to do that on a stable kernel. Because it's one of those things that will work perfectly for everybody. Or oh, then somebody who eventually a week later will say, it doesn't work on the following Mac store drive. And you look at the code, and your code is wrong. But everybody else's drive was happy with it. And those kind of things where you can people, users can lose data are just too risky in most cases to fix. So we really, really try and avoid that kind of thing. There, there are one or two other areas where you fix one bug and you break another one. Um, some of the low-level code would be like that. Uh, where you have to, you have to wait until the bug settles down in the development tree. And you look at it, you see, oh, see, someone's fixing the signal handling code, particularly, which normally means that there will be about 10 patches over a period of a week before it works again. Because it's very subtle, very complex code. And so you, you, sort, of, you sort of learn to say, well, I don't think that's the whole story. You have to wait until the whole story before you know what to back for. And uh, so what I'm trying to do is to have a stable, conservative tree for the, for the kernel. The, the AC tree is not the right answer to this, because there's only one of me to start with. There really should be three or four maintainers reviewing these kind of patches. 
Partly because you've got several people looking at each change, there's a much higher chance that one of those, that group of people is going to say, oh, but that's wrong, or there's a side effect here. And also because people go on holiday or to conferences, and you don't want the stable kernel to stop because someone's at a conference. You don't want not to be able to get your security fixed because the security maintainer is on holiday. Because the bad guys don't take those holidays. Um, and we bad, so we, we badly need a, a more formal process for this. And um, I'm still trying to kick people into creating one. We also need a better security policy for bugs that Linus knows about. So that the vendors can find out. So that the people who need to know can find out. And so that things then get released to the public in a more organized fashion. Because the truth of the matter is that the bad guys do read every one of them as patches. I also read them all as patches, so I pity them the effort. <laughs> but they will pick out security fixes that Linus and other people think are quiet fixes nobody will notice. In part because security fixes have a definite look. But also people just use their common sense. So there are certain people who mostly contribute security fixes. So you look through the thing and, it, and, and it'll have some ears and less Linus comment like, correct handling of sign bit on the blah. And it says, from solar designer. And it's like, uh, this is somebody who only commits security fixes. Therefore, this is a security fix. You just can't sort of hide these kind of things. Just some, people, some people try to. Um, and yeah, ultimately, I would still like to get to the point where we have 269, 2691, 2692, 2693. A proper process for this. In the meantime, I shall carry on doing it myself. And we need it for Fedora anyway, so from a Red Hat point of view, it makes sense to do it. And it helps with other vendors because we can work, by having a public patch, it means other vendors are working together, like can work with people with different distributions who are doing the same thing and say, oh, we need to fix this bug, we need to fix this problem. And that's really the end of the talk part. I'll leave some time for questions. Do we have a question? We do questions. Sorry, this week. I have to hear it first. <laughs> Code, code coverage work. 
is that there are a large number of bugs which don't get seen by humans, but get seen very well by verification tools. And that's really important because verification tools, they run all day. You can run a verification tool 24 hours a day. It doesn't go on holiday. It doesn't need paying. And everybody can use it. So the verification tool side is becoming more and more important. I think that's a trend, not just in open source either. There's a lot more interest now in formal verification software. Any more? Yeah. 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 Too many people around. Yes, okay. <laughs> Uh, BitKeeper. The big problem with the BitKeeper license is that BitKeeper, BitKeeper itself is a piece of proprietary software. Uh, Larry McCoy, the author, a stat, you, know, you have a conversation with him, he will give you good, rational reasons why it's a piece of proprietary software, why it doesn't work as an open source model, and he took good arguments about that. And that in itself is fine. You know, I use other pieces of proprietary software. The big problem I have with it is, is you're allowed to use it in certain cases for open source software, but only if you're not doing work on version control systems. Right? Now I occasionally have to do things like patch CVS, and I'm not going to give up my rights to do that, to use a piece of proprietary software. The other thing, partly this came from as well in my case, is that BitKeeper is actually not very good at doing the kind of backporting work I do. Because BitKeeper understands everything in terms of chain sets. So if you say, I want this chain set, what BitKeeper does is say, okay, you, that means you also need this, 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 that works back to the dependencies. Now when you're backporting, what you actually often want to do is say, I want this chain set, I don't want the other stuff. Right? As a version control system, the software is not capable of deducing whether that is a good idea or not. It can't handle it. It takes a human to say, yes, this is a valid thing to do. So in that respect, it doesn't help me. Having said that, there are other tools like Quilt, which I don't use, which I should learn how to use. I'm just bad at tools sometimes. Hmm? Obviously. <laughs> yeah, back?
Pull the drivers across and delete the old ID layer. Denied it's ever written in the first place. And that, yeah, those are a problem because patches to the ID layer code is very, very hard to be sure they're safe because the locking is so confused and complicated. Um, same with the TTY layer. The TTY layer needs, needs, a, needs a volunteer to rewrite it. Uh, Ted Cho wrote it for the 1.2 kernel. In the days of the 1.2 kernel, it was really good, it was very, very fast, very clever optimizations, which relied on the fact that you had a single processor computer. It's not moved on a great deal since then, other than kind of emergency fixes to make it work multiprocessor. Or most of the emergency fixes we found a few later we should have done a long time ago. So yes, there are some really, really grungy, horrible bits of code. The other thing you find in terms of stability is that the more bizarre and peculiar your system is, the less likely it is to work well. Because a lot of bugs are found by people reviewing code, and they review code they care about, or by using it. So the PC platform is very, very stable. If you've got an absolute, you go by absolutely generic, boring PC, it's probably the most stable Linux configuration. You compare that to Linux on an obscure Linux platform like the Dex station, and there's very few users. So there are lots and lots of latent bugs which no one has hit yet. So there is sort of a lesson though, which is the, the more your hardware is like everybody else, the better in terms of stability. Okay, more questions? More up here? Yep. What's your view on backporting from 206 to 204? If you're backporting from 26 to 24. Um, my view is that this nice Marcelo guy does it. <laughs> it's getting very hard to do for a lot of the code because so much has changed in the core code between the two. Some parts of the kernel it's very easy because the code is still common. But a lot of stuff you can't, you, you really can't backport that far. The diff between the 2.4 and 2.6 kernel is, I think it's like 40 megabytes. It's huge. Yeah, we've, 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 we've rewritten more between 2.4 and 6 than the size, I think, of the 2.0 kernel. It's hugely different. So that kind of backboarding is, is, is often very hard. Um, the problem with that is then trying to track security fences, which is one of the reasons we have things on the vendor set mailing list. Because somebody finds a 2.6 bug, and you look at, okay, 2.4 has the same bug, but the code around it is different, so you've got to fix it differently. And also, it may be the case that 2.4 has the same bug in different places. So there, there are people who do that. Obviously, the vendors, because they do seven-year support and five-year support on enterprise products, have to do this. And this tends to get done on the vendor set mailing list, or between various maintainers. Yeah? Um, the development structure that you've been explaining here is much less rigid than <coughs> comparative uh, development structures in the BSDs, like OpenBSD. Yeah. And, and it, it's, it's ironic, it, it almost seems to be more anarchic at the top than it is further down, because you've described how the vendors apply discipline. Uh, but, and and there's, a certain, there's quite an amount of pain that's gone through there. So w what do you see as the clear benefits of this fairly anarchic uh, um. The, the thing which started the 2.6 model on this idea of continuously rolling updates is that with 2.4 there were a lot of problems that didn't get fixed promptly because everybody was so scared about the size of the code. <laughs> everybody was so scared about the size of patches. And so I actually ended up doing a 2.4 AC kernel, which was different from the 2.6 AC kernel which is all the patches Linus was forgetting. And this ended up as a, group, as a really big patch, but it made things more stable. And other people had similar experiences. So people started to wonder whether, in fact, we were making the kernel less stable by not applying patches, and that we had the model wrong. Now we're trying the other model. We're starting to understand that perhaps there's some other bits you have to fill in as well we hadn't anticipated, which is to have these point releases. But it's very experimental. We, we try things and see what happens. Um, once you get, yeah, once you get to the enterprise vendor level, it gets very rigid. And internally to the company, you have policies like a patch is proposed, 
Two people have to accept the patch and acknowledge the patch. Someone else signs off that it has been applied. All the things you'd expect when you're doing an enterprise product where you can't have regressions. Yeah. Okay. One red bit aside. Oh, there's one more here. Yeah. Um, have your MBA studies changed your perspective? Have they? Have your MBA studies have they changed your perspective on open source development? Yeah. Uh, in one or two respects. Because I have a much better idea of how other or other parts of industry handle quality control. And once you understand, for example, how car manufacturers handle quality control, the software industry looks really embarrassing. <laughs> oh, there is a lot to learn in the software industry, I think, in that, and partly from other businesses. So yes, in that respect, yeah. there. Okay, let's go quickly over the other side. How much time have we got left? Or are we overrunning? What was that? Sorry? Four minutes. Okay, so a couple of questions from this slide if there are any. I can't say anything about the SCO trial because my employer is currently suing SCO. Sorry. <laughs>